Scripture this morning is found in James, first chapter, verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. I know the Lord will add a blessing to the reading of his word. So last Sabbath, we talked about our responsibility to the poor. And I ended by saying that I would like to paint for you a, a vision for our church um, and share that with you this Sabbath. And that's what I'm gonna be doing, but I'll be leading up to that. My presentation is called The Church Amongst the Poor and the Needy. Good. So 20 years ago, America experienced um, an earth-shaking event with the Twin Towers coming down. It's hard to even grapple with, you know, the 3,000 lives that were lost on that day and the ramifications that this has had for our country. I mean, it has changed our country in so many different ways. For the last 20 years, we've been fighting wars across the world against terrorists, and this has impacted our own mentality towards the world around us. We've become more suspicious. We've become more heartless, uh, less sympathetic. But the question is, what have we learned from this? Have we learned anything? Are we better people as a result of this? I think one of the lessons that I've learned and that's become very clear is that war does not work. War creates more problems. And I mean, terrorism has spread beyond Afghanistan to North Africa, to Africa, uh, to the Far East, and to, to many places. So rather than somehow destroying our enemies, we've multiplied them as a result of what has happened. I think what we've learned is that really humanitarian work is the best way of neutralizing our enemies. It's by loving them. And I remember, you know, just right after 9-11, being at a dinner where there were several theologians from the seminary, including the president of the seminary, and they were just asking a lot of, a lot of questions about, you know, what we had accomplished. And I think they came to the conclusion in that conversation that what, you know, what if we had responded with love and kindness? Uh, what if we had been humanitarian? What kind of impact would that have had? You know, it would have had a totally different impact than our approach to it. So I think really we need to reorient ourselves to the world and change our approach to many of the problems that we try to solve with force. Now Jesus, in his time, tried to reorient his people he tried to realign Israel uh, and their worship with the character of God and God's mission. He began already in the very early phases of his ministry to bring about a great reformation because his people had really wandered away from the very essentials and the basics of what God had called them to do. And what does he do? He goes into the temple and he cleanses the temple of this money and this power that had corrupted the worship of God. And so he showed from the very start of his ministry that he was interested in bringing his people back to God's plan and God's purposes and God's character and what God was calling them to do. Today we're gonna be looking at uh, one chapter in the Gospels, Luke chapter 14, and we're gonna be looking at the kind of reformation that Jesus wanted to bring about amongst his people. So I invite you to open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 14, we'll be going through the whole chapter, and learning the lessons that God wants us to learn from this chapter. The first um, lesson that Jesus tried to teach in this chapter is that he attempted to show Israel that caring for the needs of others 
is central to God's character and his law and his mission. Now somehow, God's people had lost sight of this very, very basic thing. And we're gonna see how Jesus tried to recover this and, and help his people to get back to it. Let's start with verse one. Now it happened as he went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, that they watched him closely. And behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. So here it is that Jesus did what he normally did. He fellowshiped with people. He fellowshiped with sinners, with tax collectors, and he fellowshiped also with the Pharisees and the religious leaders. Jesus was a social person, and he used his social interactions to lead people into a deeper relationship with God. Now the Pharisees were gathered there, it seems, to find fault with him because they were watching him very closely. We saw that in last sermon when we looked at, you know, this gathering that they had in Mark chapter 2 in Capernaum in the house of Peter. They were there to spy on him and to find fault with him. And all of a sudden, there appears this man with dropsy. Now, dropsy um, is a condition where, you know, fluid fills up uh, the body as a result of disease. It seems like this man comes out of nowhere. It says, behold, there was a certain man. And the Pharisees don't seem to be concerned at all for his needs. But Jesus has a very different attitude. And immediately, Jesus answering spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? It seemed like they must have been having some kind of a conversation going because the text says that he was answering them. But it doesn't tell us what the conversation was about. But Jesus poses the question, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Now the Sabbath is at the very heart of God's Ten Commandments. It is the seal of God's law. And Jesus was using the Sabbath and used the Sabbath on many occasions to teach the essence of what God's law is all about. He was trying to reform not just Sabbath keeping, but he was trying to reform their understanding of God's law and their understanding of their own mission. So he asked the question, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Now for the Jew at that time, it was not considered lawful because they had many of their own traditions and their own ideas of what was acceptable on the Sabbath. And Jesus was trying to challenge these traditions and reintroduce them to God's heart and the spirit of the law that God had given mankind. But they kept silent in verse 4. And he took him and healed him and let him go. Now why do you think they kept silent in this instance? I don't know, it must have been because they were worried about entrapping themselves. But they had a a very clear answer to this question. Then he answered them saying, which of you have a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? So what Jesus was doing here was that he was basically uh, getting them to realize the inconsistency of their own Sabbath keeping. While they treated animals well, they treated humans horribly. They wouldn't even help a, a human who was in need of help. So Jesus was getting them to understand the inconsistency of their behavior. And they couldn't really answer him on these things either because Jesus had really discovered the heart of their problem, their inhumanity towards man. What Jesus was trying to teach was that caring for other people's needs is central to God's character. And when he gave the Sabbath, he was not taking that away or limiting our capacity or opportunity to care for other people. The Sabbath was about rest. It was about relieving our workers, relieving the people around us from work and from uh, hardship. And so healing would have been totally consistent with what God's intention was. So he was trying to return them to the central purpose of the entire law of God, which was to reflect his character and his mission. So that's the, the first thing that he taught in this very important gathering of the leaders of Israel. The second lesson that he tried to teach them during this uh, very 
interesting gathering was that he sought to help them to realize that they were servants and not masters. You see, as leaders, they had developed this notion that people were to serve them. Look what happens next. He told a parable to those who were invited when he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, when you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and him come and say to you, give place to this man, and then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. And when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place, so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So what's very interesting about this is that he noticed how these people were all seeking the highest position, the highest place at this gathering. Uh, they were hungry for recognition. They were hungry uh, for position and for influence. And Jesus appeals in a way to that motive when he tries to reason with them. But listen, you guys shouldn't be seeking the highest place for de for, because you would, be, you would gain much more respect if you took a lower position and then somebody recognized that you had taken too low of a position and gave you a higher position. You would gain more respect by that. So he was appealing in a way to their selfish natures to be unselfish. I mean, you can go so low in your life that the only appellation that touches you at all is an appeal to your own selfishness. And, and that's where these people that's where these leaders had gone in their spiritual walk. He, he had to speak to them where they were at. But Jesus was here stating a very important principle, and that is that we are called to be servants and not masters. Jesus stated this principle in another place, in another way, in Matthew chapter 20, when he spoke to the disciples. And this is what he said to them. And when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over you and those who are great exercise authority over you. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So in this story, two of the disciples were seeking for the highest position in the kingdom of God. And, and they were, in a way, expressing the feelings and the thoughts of the other disciples. And Jesus was correcting them, and he's correcting us about the nature of his kingdom and telling us that we are called to be servants just like he came to be our servant. He came to take the lowest position by giving his life for humanity in order that we might have a higher position. So Jesus is really calling his people to recognize that they are servants and not masters. And we want to really follow the, the train of Jesus' thought here because he's teaching one lesson after another lesson to these leaders. And now look at the next lesson he teaches them. Jesus was seeking to imbue his people with a new motive for their social interactions. Right? We saw earlier how they were very selfishly driven. Influence, power, um, attention. But he wanted to imbue them with a, a new motive. He wanted to imbue them, imbue them with this intentional desire to help other people and not benefit themselves. Look at what happens next in Luke chapter 14, verse 12. So the religious leaders um, were there gathered and he told them this. He says, then he also said to him who invited him, when you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So here Jesus turns now 
I mean, before he had been directing everything that he said to the guests and to everybody kind of in general. But here he turns actually to the one who had invited everybody. I don't know. I mean, this could sound very offensive. But you know, Jesus must have done it in a very, very polite and kind way. And what he said essentially was that there was something wrong with the gathering. Because this gathering was about maintaining social relations, maintaining friendships. But Jesus was saying, no, when it comes to our social interactions, we should be interacting with people in order to help them, in order to lift them up, in order to make them better. Um, this was extremely countercultural in, in Christ's day and in our day too. I mean, when we have parties, who do we normally invite? We invite our, our friends, our family, um, maybe colleagues. Um, but to invite people and to socialize with them simply because people are needy and need help, this is what Jesus was calling them to, and this is what he's calling us to. In fact, we can summarize this in just one or two words, Disent disinterested benevolence. We talked about that last time. But here Jesus is showing how this should impact our social relations. Disinterested benevolence means uh, showing kindness and love without any regard to gain, to self-gain. The third, the fourth thing, in all of this, Jesus was seeking to align his people with his kingdom. I mean, they were standing over here doing their own thing, focused on their own agenda. Jesus was wanting to bring them over to his kingdom, that they would be doing his agenda. And look what he does next. Now, when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. So the conversation turns to the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said to him, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many and sent a servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. First said to him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I have brought five yokes of oxen and I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I have married a wife and therefore I can't come. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. Now notice these groups of people that were to be brought in. The poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. These are the same groups that Jesus had said they ought to invite into their homes. That's a very important observation because that connects this parable that Jesus is telling with the instructions that he had given to them. Verse 22, and the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. So here it is that Jesus tells a parable about the kingdom. And the whole point of the parable is for us to understand what God is doing in the world. And what is God doing in the world? He's trying to include as many people in his kingdom as possible, right? He's trying to include as many people as possible. And he sends out his servants to the highways and the hedges to compel, you know, the ones who are weak and, and truly in need to come into his kingdom. And Jesus is saying, really, that I want you to be part of this. Right? And your social interactions, I want you to be part of this by inviting these people into your home and caring for their needs. So the kingdom of God is seeking to minister to the poor and needy, and we're called to be part of this global effort. 
You know, I love this quote from The Desire of Ages. Um, to me, it just shows the, the beautiful character of God in his effort to reach out to as many people as possible. The Desire of Ages, for, you, for those who don't know, is a book about the life of Jesus. And we have copies, actually. It's just a tremendous book. She says that the angels of heaven are sent forth to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. We know not who they are. It is not yet, yet made manifest who shall overcome and share the inheritance of the saints in light. But angels of heaven are passing throughout the length and the breadth of the earth, seeking to comfort the sorrowing, to protect the imperiled, to win the hearts of men to Christ. Not one is neglected or passed by. God is no respecter of persons, and he has an equal care for all the souls he has created. What a tremendous picture. God doesn't send his angels out just to the redeemed. God is sending his angels out to every single person that exists in this world. And he's focusing on the sorrowful, the imperiled. He's focusing on the needy in this world. And he's trying to win them over to God. No one is neglected. To think that we can be part of this plan. Look what she says. She goes on to say, as you open your door to Christ's needy and suffering ones, you are welcoming unseen angels. Now, how is that possible? It is possible because every single person has an angel. And when we're helping the needy, those angels are coming into our presence. You invite the companionship of heavenly beings. They bring a sacred atmosphere of joy and peace. They come with praises upon their lips, and an answering strain is heard in heaven. Every deed of mercy makes music there. What a tremendous picture. So as we reach out to the needy, we are coming in the presence of God's angels. We are partaking and participating in what the angels are doing and cooperating with them. You know, this week I had this experience that reminds me of the fact that we can cooperate with God in helping others. I was driving, you know, back into town, and I came under the highway. I came, you know, to the um, gas station, and lo and behold, there was a, a beggar who was begging on the side of the road. And as I was driving past him, I just felt impressed that I should help him. Now, you know, this doesn't come from us. It's not because we are good. In fact, the opposite. But God wants to use us. And uh, I just felt impressed that, you know, I needed to help in some way. And so, you know, the bank is several blocks down the road, and I didn't have any money on me. So I had time to think about this invitation. And I had time, you know, to reject it if I wanted to. But I decided not to reject it. So I got to the bank, and of course, you can't take out less than $20. So I took out $20. And I went back and I went to the gas station and got some gas and exchanged it for, yeah, one $10 and two $5 bills. And I had made up my mind that I was going to give him $10. So I drive up to him and I just get out and I say, you know, so what is going on? So, I, you know, I basically just opened up the conversation by asking what's happening in his life. And he starts telling me his story. And as he started telling me his story, of course, I was drawn into his story and began to realize that he had a genuine need. Um, and I was compelled to help him with $20. And, uh, and so I did that. You know, I think often we are suspicious, and I think rightly so, because a lot of times people pull the wool over our eyes. But I think if we listen to their stories, try to understand them, try to help them where they really need help. God will show us what we can do for them. And in this particular situation, I felt that God wanted me to, to help him. He was a Christian, and he had left his former employment because his boss was not to be trusted. And he was going down to California for a, another job, a potential job, he said. And, uh, you know, I wanted to help him get there. 
So I don't know for sure if his story was right, but you know when you start listening to a person, you just sense that that person is genuine, and I had felt compelled to, to help him. But it's just tremendous to think that you know somehow we can play just a small little role in somebody else's walk and life. And I took the opportunity to pray with him and to really just lift him up and ask for God's blessing upon his life. So Christ wants us to align our social interactions with the kingdom's mission. All of our social interactions. And a lot of times we're going to have to change our perceptions and our mindset to be in alignment with God's work. Let me share with you another quote. Uh, this is from Review and Herald. Uh, I think this is such a meaningful quote for us today. <clears throat> so this is uh, a quote that's directed to us as a church. And it said here, why has it not been understood from the word of God that the work being done in medical missionary lines is a fulfillment of the scripture. Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. The servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. So this is telling me that the Lord has given to us very clear instructions that are relevant for our time. We are called to be medical missionaries. Now that's a term that has been used within our church context for now generations. It's a term that I think we misunderstand because we think a medical missionary is somebody who focuses primarily on medical stuff, but that's not how um, it was originally meant. It was basically meant as a term used for helping people in their, with their needs, whatever those needs were with, of course, a special emphasis on the health aspect of it. And the Lord is saying that that is a fulfillment of this invitation that the kingdom of God is stretching out to us to go out and to call in people who are poor, maimed, halt, and blind. Right? These terms should be understood literally, but they also have a figurative meaning. It's basically all those who are in need we are called to minister to. And the Lord said unto the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. This is the work that the churches in every locality, north, south, east, and west, should do. The churches have been given the opportunity of answering this work. Why have they not done it? Someone must fulfill the commission. So you and I have received this grand commission and we're invited to be part of it. And the question is, will we respond to that? The fifth point that Jesus tried to make in the course of Luke 14 is that he said that we must decide if we want to be citizens in his kingdom. Because it's going to cost us something. Are we willing to take up the responsibilities inherent in being a disciple? You know, Jesus went on to say this. He said, you know, well, we're told that great multitudes were with him. And he turned and he said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not hear, bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So Jesus had just talked about the kingdom and what the kingdom was about. He had talked about how they were to be part of this kingdom by changing their social interactions. And then he's telling them that, listen, this is going to involve a cost. You're gonna to have to change your ways. Are you willing to pay the price to be part of this? 
And then he compares God's people to salt. And he says that if we want to be salt in this world, we're going to have to pay that cost. Because if we do not have um, that disinterested benevolence, then we've lost our saltiness. We've lost the influence that we were meant to have in this world. And so he calls us to hear. Now the sixth point, and this we're going to have to go beyond Luke chapter 14, is that in the judgment, our destiny will be determined by what we have done for the needy. Now this to me is a very, very important point. We find this point being made in a very simple parable in Matthew chapter 25. Um, I want us to really consider the seriousness of this parable. So Jesus tells a parable in which the Son of Man comes in his glory. And he says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. He's talking about the second coming here. He had just spoken about it in chapter 24, using the same language for his second coming. Now, the second coming is going to be a kind of a judgment, right? It's not going to be the investigative portion of the judgment, but it's going to be the meeting out of the sentences. Um, and so all the living are going to be gathered before Jesus when he returns in the clouds of heaven, when he comes in his glory. Now, the kingdom of God has already come in terms of the kingdom of grace, right? The kingdom of grace is here now. We have access to grace today. But the kingdom of glory has not come yet. That comes when Jesus returns. So he's talking about the kingdom of glory. And it says here that all the nations will be gathered before him. Now, this term nations is not just a reference to churches and Christians and, and his followers. This is a reference to every single person that is alive. So this parable applies to everyone. He had just told two parables, the parable of, you know, the, um, the talents and the parable of the, um, the, the women who were waiting for the, the wedding. Uh, those apply to the church, right? He was giving very deep lessons to his people. But here he's actually talking about all of us. So all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Now, how are we going to be separated? Well, we know that when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, the ones who have believed in him, they will be recreated in his image. The ones who are dead, who have believed in him, will be resurrected and recreated, and they will go with him into the clouds of heaven, whereas the ungodly will be left behind. So that's how they're going to be separated. Now, he's going to separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Now, shepherds, of course, often would flock the sheep and the goats together in the same flock, herd them in the same flock. And so it was at that point that they were to be separated. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then he says what distinguishes the sheep. He says, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. So Jesus has identified himself with the weakest, with the most needy here in society. He became a human being. He became a poor human being. And so he has so closely identified himself with the poor and the weak in this world. And he's saying that when we minister to anybody in this world, we are ministering to him. And look at the ways in which they've ministered to him. They provided the basics, right? Food, water, you know, shelter, clothing, um, helping the sick those who are in prison, encouraging them. Now, what's very interesting is that many people will say, well, how did we do this, Lord? Uh, we didn't see you. So here you have him talking to people 
who didn't even know him, right? We're talking to people who never heard the gospel. These are the people that are coming to Jesus in the clouds of heaven saying, when did we serve you? Right? They didn't realize that when they were helping the needy, they were actually serving Jesus because they didn't know. They hadn't heard about Jesus. And so here you have it that there are um, people who never responded to the gospel who are going to be in the kingdom of God. Right? That's what this is actually teaching us, that there will be people in the kingdom of God who didn't know Jesus because they didn't have a chance to hear about him. And yet they responded to his spirit and they showed his kindness and his love in their lives because they followed God without even knowing it. What everything hinges upon here is basically how people respond to the needy. That is the decisive thing in the judgment. Now, in The Desire of Ages, she says the same thing. She says, Thus Christ on the Mount of Olives pictured to his disciples the scene of the great judgment, and he represented its decision as turning upon one point. When the nations are gathered before him, there will be but two classes, and their eternal destiny will be determined by what they have done or have neglected to do for him in the person of the poor and the suffering. Now, we need to say, and we need to make this very clear, that we are not saved by works. We are saved by grace, grace alone. Now the Bible teaches this very clearly, right? Titus chapter three, I love this chapter. You know, we were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior towards man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So Paul teaches basically that, you know, we were lost until Jesus, because of his great love, saved us. And he saved us by two things. He saved us by giving us his spirit and he saved us by justifying us of our sins. So he has granted to us forgiveness, justification, and he's also granted to us his spirit to aliven us and waken us to him and, and to our responsibility. And through his spirit, we have been able and through his justification to be accepted before him. So it is the work of God. And yet, Paul also says in the same book that grace trains us to do good works, right? The Holy Spirit is training us and teaching us to do good works. Chapter two, verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us. The word here is paideoa, which means to teach or to train or to instruct that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify him for himself, his own special people, zealous for good works. So he mentions seven things that, that the grace of God is training us to do. Seven things. Now, seven is a perfect number. So he's obviously trying to encompass everything in this. And the last thing is that he is training us for z to be zealous for good works. If we don't respond to his training, we are rejecting his salvation. We need to heed the calling. In fact, the Bible speaks about this in no uncertain terms. Matthew chapter 7 not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. So profession is not enough. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So although we are saved by grace, 
which is undeniable, we will be judged by our works. We could take out much more time to flesh this out and understand it, but that's what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that we will receive uh, judgment based upon what we've done in the body, whether it be good or bad, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. So this leads me to my final point. If this is all true, that God is, has called us to something as grand as working with his kingdom, to use our social relations to help the poor and the needy come into his kingdom, then what can we do as a church to help our community? Well, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. For generations now, Adventists have been working to help their community. And they, we've developed this organization called Adventist Community Services. Now, this organization is very active all over the country, and I think also in other parts of the world. <clears throat> this has a long history to it. In fact, if you go back to the 1800s, um, Adventists started the Dorcas Society. But this developed over time, and today it's called Adventist Community Services International. So this is not a new thing. But I believe we need to get involved in this. This is something that God wants us to be part of. We have all the evidence for that I've just laid out for you, that this is what God is calling his people to. This is what we will be judged for. Now, Adventist Community Services is humanitarian relief and an individual and community development and relief ministry. So it is a relief organization that tries to help people on an individual level and tries to help the community. Now, it does basically four things, and I would say it focuses on the first three of these. It helps with relief work. Now, relief work is basically like giving food to a hungry person. You're helping them in the moment that they need help. And that's good. That's important work. When somebody's really hungry, when they're struggling, you need to help them with their immediate problem. And yet, we really desire to do more than that. We desire actually to help with individual development, right? Instead of just giving people food, we want to teach a person to fish. We want to teach a person to become uh, independent. Uh, also, helping the community. So that's, you know, community development is like providing a person with fishing equipment. And then there's also changing the structure of the community, providing fair access, things like that. But so that, that's kind of what Adventist Community Service is about. And there are different areas in which a community service can get involved in. Housing, unemployment, family brokenness, health, right? There are different areas in which we can minister. But basically, it's up to us as a church to decide what is the Lord calling us to do? Where can we best serve the community? There are other organizations here in town that are doing, you know, food drive. Others that are providing cheap clothing. But what can we do here in town to make a difference? Now, could it be that God is calling us to also have a food pantry? Yes, it could be that he's also calling us to do that. But God would really have to lead us to see that. I think it's better to do something that nobody else is doing. Now, these are some ideas that others have tried and that others are doing. You know, food pantries, soup kitchens, clothing distribution, drug and alcohol abuse prevention, disaster response, crisis intervention, tutoring and mentoring, career training, job placement, health screening. You know, the list goes on, right? There are many, many different things that we could get involved in. Older adult ministries for seniors and caregivers. Now, I hesitate really to share my own dream because really what I want us to do is I want us to come together and to pray together, to do research together, and to seek God's will together. But I just want to share a dream. This is just one dream. Can you imagine if we started like a vegetarian food store here in town that would maybe not open up every day of the week, but open up a few days of the week, uh, maybe with a small cafe, maybe with Christian books, can you imagine having like a, a health and wellness center where we could educate people the New Start principles, have a cooking school, uh, overcoming addictions classes, mental health classes? 
It would be amazing if in that center, that work, we could also work with families having lectures and courses on issues that families are dealing with. Also having a homeless ministry, a job center to help people with that issue and disaster relief. There are just so many things that we could do. What about building a building? I mean, we have plenty of space here. I mean, I'm, now I'm dreaming big here, and I'm not saying that we need this. In fact, if we don't need it, we don't want to do it. But think for a moment. I mean, if we're going to be truly provide a service that will impact the community and you know, grow, we're going to have to have a place to meet. And I just imagine, what if we built a building right here in the side, in the parking lot? I don't know. But, you know, Maranatha could maybe be invited here to help build a place, and we could do it very cheaply. So what is the path forward? Well, it's not about my dreams. It's really about how God is going to lead us. And uh, in order to be led by God, we have to do our part. We have to do our research. Now, the the Adventist um, North Pacific Union is holding a convention this week, this coming week. This is an online convention to educate churches and leaders about ministering to people's needs. It's called the Urban Ministries Convention, but actually it's not really for just urban work. It's for any kind of um, benevolent work. And uh, this is going to start, I think, on Thursday, September the 16th. And they have different tracks. So Adventist Community Services, and they have different things as you see here. If you want to be part of this, please come up to me afterwards. I can get you a, re um, a reduced price. It's actually normally $30 per person, but we can actually get it for $15 a person. And this will be just a tremendous opportunity for us to learn. So I invite you to be part of this convention. Basically, we need to pray and we need to research. Now, next Sabbath, I want to invite you to an important meeting. After church, after our potluck meal, we're going to have our first meeting to talk and discuss what the Lord is calling us to do. So we're going to already start on something. And I just want to invite you to start praying already for God's leading and guidance. And um, we're going to come together. We're going to come together in here so that we can keep social distances, and we're going to be discussing different ideas and different thoughts, and uh, I want to also see whether people are interested in this. You know, who has a burden for this kind of work? Who is willing to give up their time and effort? I need, we need leaders. We need people who are willing to lead out in this and, and make this their passion. So our calling is to help people, and in the process of helping them, win their hearts to Jesus, the Messiah. That is our calling in this life, right? Our goal is to win them to Jesus. But we want to help them with their needs. Um, just a very brief story. So there was a church that had a food pantry. And so they, they would invite these people that would come for food to be with them and worship God together. And this was the, for many of them, this was their only uh, interaction with Christians and, and worship. And the pastor said that every year they would have about 25 people that would come to know Jesus and many of them would come and become part of the church as a result of their work. I want to just end with this quote. Christ came to the earth to walk and work among the poor. To the poor he preached the gospel. His work is the gospel worked out on medical missionary lines. In justice, in mercy, and the love of God, which is the sure fruit born because the tree is good. And today, in the person of his believing, working children, who move under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, Christ visits the poor and the needy, relieving want and alleviating suffering. So Christ wants to work through you and me today. As we pray, I just want to invite you to pray with me. God, I want to obey the Spirit. I want to do what you're calling me to do. Show me, show us, that we might relieve the want of those who need help. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, it is truly extraordinary to consider that 
You have called us to be part of this very revolutionary and countercultural movement of people who think about others and who use their social resources and interactions to help and bless others. And we want to become a community that is making an impact on this community. And Father, we don't know exactly how you want us to do this, but we are convinced that it is your will because you have given to us very clear instructions. Now we need your Holy Spirit to lead us into applying these instructions to our situation. And I ask that your Holy Spirit would lead us individually and collectively, and that together we would function as a team, a well-oiled team, Lord. Thank you for the blessing of your word and for the blessing of the instructions of Jesus Christ. Amen.